when you're talking your story. It has to do with your heart and when you have the heart of wanting to serve and to help and to encourage one another. It has nothing to do with the benefits of being a Christian. That, those are secure in our salvation in Jesus Christ. But what changes people's lives is how you handle uh, your relationship with Christ. In the first week, we talked about connecting with one another. In the second week, we talked about sharing, our, or, or we talked about um, serving one another. The third week, we talked about being very generous. And, and uh, last week, we had a, a bunch of coins up here. Talking about giving our heart and giving our life just out of the simplicity of our hearts. And now we have this container in the back, and we're just asking you uh, just to put your, your coins together on a weekly basis and drop in the coins. And it's to change our heart, to change our ways, to change the future of our church. Today, we're talking about not the facilities and not our ministries. Today, we're talking about our story, the individual story that you have. Once we became a Christ follower, we have a story that we must tell. The Bible calls it a witness. A witness is somebody that has experienced something or has seen something. If you were at the court of law and you were called as a witness, they would ask you certain questions. And those questions that they would ask you as a witness would have to be something that you experienced or that you saw. If you would try to tell the attorney or the jury something that you heard somebody else say or something somebody else did, they would say this was hearsay and not admissible. When we're talking about our story, we're talking about being a witness. What has God done through you? What has he done for you? When we're talking about our story, we're talking about connecting with other people's lives, not in a preachy mindset, but in a tender, open, generous way. There's a story that we've all heard many times, and it's a story of the woman at the well. Jesus meets this woman that has had a lifestyle that was, un it was clearly not of God. And Jesus meets her need by talking to her and ministering to her. And when Jesus was ministering to her, she was, she was amazed at what he could do, and amazed at what he knew. And he went, and she went back to the city. And it's found in John chapter 4, verses 39 through 42. As a springboard into being a witness or telling our story, this woman that Jesus encountered told her city the story. And this is what it says. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And they stayed there for two days, and many more believed because of his word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and now we are indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. It started off with a woman telling a story. They invited Jesus around him, and now they believe in Jesus. It all starts with a story, and Jesus calls that story our witness or our testimony. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, and Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, you will be my witness. When they hear the story, it can change their life. Now, the story. You have a story. You have a story that sometimes we're ashamed of, but sometimes we need to share. The story that you have, the life that you live, how Jesus impacted your life, sometimes it is not pleasant. And sometimes we want to stick our head in the sand and say it does not exist. But your story, your life, what God has done for you. We could have multiple people come on the stage and we could tell your story. 
And you would say, I don't want people to know my story. And some of you would come up and say, this is what God has done, and he's done a wonderful work, and we get praise, glory, and honor to God. But it's still your story. I love it when people come into the office and, and uh, they tell me their story. Because what they're doing is being transparent and being genuine. And I could say your story that you are sharing can fit in multiple different lives. Many couples, many families have those same exact issues. Maybe different and maybe tweaked here and there. But your story. Your story is not anybody else's story. Your story is an eyewitness account of what Jesus Christ has done within your life. That's your story. What you do with your story matters. What you do about your story matters. Is it a story for yourself, or is your story something that you can relate to others? A few months ago, I had a privilege of meeting a brand new couple. They came to church on a Sunday morning, and, and um, they met me, and they started talking to me, and we started talking um, thereafter. And a few weeks ago, um, as they were telling me their story, and I knew what I was preparing here, um, I asked them, I said, would you mind sharing your story to the church? And uh, they graciously accepted. Now, here's the problem with sharing a story. Some of you will look at them and say, praise God. But you know what? Some of us could look at them and say, oh my. But you know what? Jesus radically changed their life. And if Jesus doesn't radically change your life or has radically changed your life, we could say to any person, oh my, can't we? But when we say, oh God, give you the glory for what you've done in this couple's life, it brings glory and honor through them, a reflection of Jesus in their story. I'm going to ask Mitch and Carla if they would make their way up here. Let's give them a round of applause as they come up and share their story. Good morning. I'm Mitch Reeves, and uh, this is my wife. I'm Carla. We've been married for about six years. We've got three kids. We've been coming to the church now for about five months, and um, I myself, I grew up in a Baptist church for most of my, most of my life. Um, after <laughs> high school and getting into college, I, I did start to pull away a little bit, um, but the whole time my family, they're real supportive of me throughout high school, being in church like they wanted me to, and even when I wasn't. Um, I've got two sisters that pretty well have supported me as well. Um, I haven't had a whole lot of hard time growing up, um, but I, I did go to college and got my degree and then went to Emporia State trying to pursue a, a higher degree, and it was there that I met my wife, Carla. Um, and I, I grew up kind of in a, in a broken household. Um, there was a lot of emotional abuse, a lot of um, psychological abuse. Yeah. Um, I came from a home where I knew about Jesus, but I did not know um, Jesus. Um, I did not get saved until I was 16 years old, and I was sitting in the back of a church. I was with a choir, um, and I just remember just feeling this feeling of just great love, which is something that I felt as a kid I had never had, and I just had this craving, and I wanted more love and more love, and and that's how I came to know Jesus and how I got saved. Um, my senior year of high school, I got pregnant. I was 17 years old. Um, and at my 22-week sonogram, um, I was told that um, I should look into terminating my pregnancy because the baby was very sick. Um, she would be born missing half of her heart. Um, and they were um, giving her a 2% survival chance after even having that open heart surgery. Um, but um, at five days old, she did have that surgery. They reconstructed her aorta. They uh, made her heart function with just the left side. Um, and then I went back to school, to Emporia State, and, and that's where I met 
my husband, and, and you know, we, we met in July, and everything moved along pretty quick. We were married by November. It was fast. <laughs> um, but, you know, the whole time, all I could think was, this is what I have always wanted. I, I've always wanted a family to love me. Um, and I stopped going to school because she got very sick. I stopped working so that I could stay home with her. And that was my dream, to be a mom and stay home and take care of my husband and take care of my kids and take care of my family. Um, and it was just perfect for me. I think whenever uh, I did see her, first meet Carla, I almost felt like it was another time in my life that God had wrapped his hands around me and said, it's, you know, you, you got to get back with me. And this, this woman, she's, she's a, a powerful daughter of mine. And she did. She shone, shone some light again. I had went down some dark roads um, um, before coming to college and before meeting her. And it was, it was really nice to have God back in my life. And Carla brought that opportunity back into my life because she was very in tune with God. And, and um, then also meeting Sasha, she started to look at me as a dad. And I have three children now, but she, she was just as my, my child, just as much as they are now. And I grew very close to her and very uh, attached to her. And again, it just felt like God had given me another gift. Um, as she did get sick, our marriage was very, it was, it was great, it was wonderful, it was the best thing I could ever imagine, but as she got sick, I really started to fear, I started to get really scared, and as she got sick, you could almost see our marriage start to just decline with her health, hand in hand, and as it declined, I just grew more fearful, and I started to pull away from God again. I just felt like, you know, why should my daughter be sick? Why should she be suffering? I've come back. I've said, I'm, you know, I want to be back in your, in your grace, God, and yet you're, my daughter's going to be sick? I just couldn't understand it, and it really hurt. And then we reached finally a point where her, her time had come, and it was her moment. Um, yeah, she had a stroke. Um, she had heart failure to begin with, um, so we were already looking into possibly getting a heart transplant. Um, and she had a stroke, which made it just completely worse. Um, but due to that stroke, the quality of life for her would not have been there, so she was taken off of the transplant list. Um, and they said that there was nothing they could do for her anymore. So we made the choice to take her off of life support um, on May 3rd of 2010. She was a year and a half. Um, and I just remember getting just so much grief about it from my own mom, saying that moms don't do that to their kids. That, um, you know, that's not what she would have done and um, that it wasn't right to do that. That I should not have ever given up on her. Um, and I was at peace with it because I felt like God was there and I felt comfort in that, that, that she was going to be safe. She was going to be whole. She was, I was going to see her again when I got to heaven. And I felt like all of that was just ripped away the moment that my mother said that moms don't do that to their kids. Um, so things I think over time after that our relationship kind of started to suffer and it I could tell Mitch had pulled away from God and gotten away and I always wanted I, I, I wanted that you know he was the first one that I ever felt that unconditional love from so I didn't want to lose that and I always pushed and pushed to to go back to church and to talk to God and to, I, I prayed for my husband, you know, to find God again and to get back into church and to just be loved and surrounded by people that loved me. Yeah, def definitely she was, 
making a lot of attempts to get us back in the church and to take that grief and take that loss and turn it over to God. I, on the other hand, was completely different. Um, I was mad at God. I wanted nothing to do with God. I felt like I gave him a chance to, to take care of my family and take care of my life, and he failed me. And so I said, you can take the back seat. I'm going to drive, and I'll, I'll keep this family safe. I'll, I'll take care of the problems. I'll fix it. You know, you bring it my way. I'm going to handle it. You've had your chance. And uh, in doing that, though, I closed down. I shut doors to, to God. I shut doors to my wife, to my family. Um, emotions, feelings, it all just I sucked it in deep. And I felt like I had to because if I didn't, I was vulnerable. And I couldn't fail my family. I couldn't let them down. I, I had already let my daughter down. And I wasn't going to let my wife down. Well, it didn't work that way. Uh, to fix things, I would get mad. I'd get angry. Uh, I'd want to control it. There was emotional abuse, mental abuse. I was basically everything a husband shouldn't be. We had children throughout the time. I was, wasn't much of a father through that time. Eventually, as this went on, I, I just got in situations, talked to people I shouldn't talk to. Got in situations I shouldn't get into. Things that were really damaging to a marriage. Things no wife wants to hear. And then on October 4th of last year, I, I found out Carla had finally had enough. And she had started to talk to people that she shouldn't talk to. Uh, get in situations she shouldn't be in. And our marriage had finally reached a point where it was it was time for, the, for that bomb to go off. And it did. It exploded. And it was a mess. Our marriage was going to be done. But it was at that time that, that that bomb went off, that the light went on. And God said, son, what are you doing? Where, are you, where have you been? What, I, I've been telling you. I'm here for you. We, we can do this together. And I did. I let go of everything. And I said, God, it's, it's time for you. So that, that Saturday night, we talked a lot. We decided we were going we to get help. Yeah, we came um, the following Sunday morning after this whole ordeal um, took place Saturday night. And um, we came to church. We, we listened to a message. And I just felt like the message was just talking to us. Um, so after service that morning, I went to go look for Pastor Bruce. I had no clue where he was going to be. I had no idea. I just, I was on a mission to go find him with my three toddlers behind me. Um, and we found him and we introduced ourselves and we said, look, we, we need somebody to talk to. We, we need help. We're falling apart. And we can't do this by ourselves. So we were provided with all of these great tools, you know, the church, we, we went to counseling. Um, we've been going to counseling for five months. Um, and we put our faith and our marriage back in God's hands. And goodness, we've been married for six years and it's like we're newlyweds yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> definitely it's, it's just completely just different and it's amazing and I just I'm so thankful that we got that and that we had that opportunity to come here and get the use the tools that we that we needed to get back on track back on a path with God and to raise our children in a godly home that he had been absent from for a very, very long time. Yeah, definitely he he didn't he didn't fail me then. You know, I said, Okay God and you know, please forgive me. I'm so sorry for everything I've been trying to do. I'm sorry for pushing you away. And it was 
it was like he probably, he probably just laughed a little bit. You know, how foolish to think that I left you. I've been behind you the whole time. I've just been waiting for you to say you need my help. Because the moment I asked, his arms went around us. They enveloped us. Because I thought that as far as I had went, as far as away from God as I had went, there was no chance, you know. It was done. I would burnt that bridge. But no matter how deep of a hole you're in, no matter how dark of a road it is, the moment you ask God to come back and help you, to ask for forgiveness, it's nothing to him. He'll shrug his shoulders, say, of course I forgive you, and he'll be right there to hold your hand and help you through it. It doesn't matter if it's yourself, your marriage, your kids. I mean, if he can save our marriage, I mean, it was... I, without God, I have no idea how I'd be here next to Carla. I'd be a very lonely man right now. Thank you very much. That's our story. A story. We all have them, and sometimes they're very difficult to share. But when you look at your kids and you look at your grandkids, maybe even your parents, you say, wow, how did we get here? How did we get in this chaos? So I want to give you some practical ideas, some tools, if you would. Just like you fix a marriage, sometimes you have to fix the surroundings of the opportunity to share your story. One of the greatest things that you can do is look for ways to share, to be genuine to share. So the first thing I want to do is I need to tell you, you need to map your world. What does that mean? You need to find your friends and your families, people you work with or go to school with, people in your neighborhood or your store or your recreational areas, your clubs or your teams. We all have people in our life that need your story. We all have couples, just like Mitch and Carla, that were flat out almost done. But outwardly, they put the face on that everything's wonderful and great. We have a story that we can share. And the first thing we need to do is not use it as a hit list, but use it as a love list. Do it as a prayer list. When we see people that we know that, that we have been healed by God and God can use my story and I need to share my story with people, not for my glory, but for God's glory, we need to do some things. We need to first pray for them. We need to pray for them before we talk to them. We need to talk to God about them before we talk to them about God. When we talk to God about our situation and we ask God to give us the ability to share my story, and then we need to introduce them to other Christians. Mitch said he was a very lonely man. When we get into a situation and we have sin within our life and our life is falling apart, what we need is we need men and women that will come around us and pray for us, encourage us. We need to introduce our family and our friends to believers that can show a positive example in front of them. And then we need to look for opportunities to witness to them. They didn't share this part, but um, they were coming home from work one day, and, and uh, Mitch's friend uh, said, hey, uh, I, see, I see you finally are getting along with the wife. And he goes, he goes yeah, he said, everything's going good. He said, can, can you come over and talk to me? My family's falling apart. Because somebody took the initiative to get back to where God wanted him to be, other people can see that they are different. Their life has been changed. We can look for opportunities. When somebody is hurting, when somebody is struggling, we can come alongside them and we can share and be a witness. Possibilities of that? We can share how God has broken us and he can use us. We can share our story. And then we can just simply offer to pray for them. 
you know, sometimes that's a very awkward thing to talk to you, to your family and your friends about, just saying, hey, uh, can I pray for you? <laughs> what do you need to pray for me about? I just, you know, if somebody says, hey, I've got an issue going on, you can't fix their issue. Only God can fix their issue. And when you say, I want to tell you my story, but I didn't get fixed on my own. God fixed me, and I want to pray for you because God is the only one that can come into your life and change your life. Give them an opportunity. The second thing is prepare your testimony. Prepare your testimony. When God gives you an opportunity to share what Jesus has done for you, it's very helpful to write it down and to prepare your testimony. As Mitch and Carla were in the office, I said, I said uh, you, what you need to do is, first of all, you need to write your testimony down. Because sometimes we can go off on all kinds of rabbit trails. But what we, have, we, have a, we have a three or four or five minute window that we can share and write our testimony down. Here's what the three things I think you ought to write your testimony down. This is what my life was before I met Jesus. This is what I was before I met Jesus. And this is how I met Jesus. And these are the differences in my life since Jesus. Talk about who you were. Talk about how you encountered Christ. And then this is what Christ has done for us. These are the differences. There's always those positive differences within your life that God can change. So where did I come from? Who am I? And what have I done since? And when we can tell people that, just a very simple three-step formula of what God has done. So let's look at the testimony and the gospel. There's a difference between the story of your life and the gospel of Jesus Christ. The testimony is what Christ has done for you. That is your story. That is your testimony. The gospel is explaining what Christ has done for everyone. We all have a story, but not all of us have the gospel. But when we have the story, it gives us the ability to share the gospel through your story. Your story, your life, what God has done for you, isn't going to change somebody's life. But your story can get into somebody's life. And when you give God the glory for what he's done within your life, then they can say, that's what I need. I've tried this. I have failed miserably. Thank you for telling your story. But how can I have what you have? And then that's when you get to share not your story but his story, what he did, how he forgave you. As what Mitch says, he looked at me and he said, look, he looked at God and said, I'm sorry. And instantaneously, God wrapped his arms around him and forgave him. That's exactly what we want to do for others. Your story is what Christ has done for you. The gospel is explaining what Christ has done for everyone. So when you look at that and you're starting to say, okay, I, I, I know I want to share the story. I'm afraid to share my story. I'm afraid that people will ridicule me, will laugh at me, will judge me. They won't like me. What do you do about that? Because we all have a story. And everyone, when they get up and they become vulnerable in their story, all have insecurities. So what do we do? Let's, let's look at some cautions. Uh, the first one I think is very important is that we need to be aware of associating with some of our old friends. Because sometimes when we share our story, sometimes people share their story in a braggadocious way and look at what I did. The story that we need to share is look at what Jesus did. Now look, look at the sin that I was in. Look at what Jesus did within the sin. But when we are around people that we used to sin with, we need to be very careful that we do share what Jesus has done for us, but we need to be strong enough to make sure that we don't get back into what the sin was that put us in the first place. We need to be very careful with that. Go back to our sinful lifestyle is not the answer. To go in and to share your story for somebody that's going to pull you back in is not the right thing. To share your story to pull them up is the right thing. And be sensitive to people. Be sensitive to people. You know, 
The Bible even says this. You shall know you're a disciple if you have love one for another. The church that is judgmental will never have the story that is going to change the world. When I know this was a role play, but this lady that's sitting right here, I think her name was Lori. They typecast this because this lady, uh, Lori, was the representation of somebody that, that was, had to be in charge, that, that judged other people, that, that, was, that was a church member, but had a major attitude in that church membership. And anytime somebody shares their story, and they are judged by their story, and we are ridiculed because of our story, do you know what happens to that story? We just zip it up. The glory of God cannot be used if the family of God is ridiculing and hurting and embarrassing somebody because of their story. That doesn't mean that we don't stand in the principles of sin. That doesn't mean that we stand up and say, that is wrong, that's what the Bible says, what we believe is this. But we hate the sin, but what do we do, church? We love the sinner. We absolutely love the person that's in the sin, because if we do not love the person in in the story, we will never point them to Jesus Christ. We have to love the sinner, but we do need to hate the sin. We love him or her so much that we will love them. We are not going to judge them. We're going to be sensitive to them and be sensitive about their story. Don't be afraid of not knowing all the answers. Some of the reasons why we don't tell our story or we don't share the gospel is we're afraid that somebody's going to ask a question I don't know. Give me that. And if somebody asks a question that I don't know, I look like I don't know. And I'll tell you, you ask me questions all the time, I don't know. And I know my computer knows because I can Google anything. <laughs> and we can Google it, we can find out, we can study, we can learn. We cannot say no to sharing our story and sharing our faith because of our fear of what we don't know. What we have to do is be strong enough. I need to get into the Word. I need to know what it says so I can share the story. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed to be a follower of Christ. Don't be ashamed of your story. Don't let the failures of your past and the story of your past keep you from lifting up your hands towards God and say, I am not ashamed. They ridiculed Jesus. They're going to ridicule me. They laughed at him. They're going to laugh at me. But you know who saved me is Jesus, and I'm going to stand up in the face of all ridicule to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. It is my story. It is the pill that saved my life. It is the only thing that I have to change. It is that Jesus came. It's my story. Claim my story. Love my story. Proclaim the message. And when you proclaim that message, that I was a sinner, but Jesus came into my life and he changed my life, and now I am saved. I was once blind, but now I see you know what? When the midst of your failures, in the midst of your fears, in the deepest, darkest times of your life, that's when the body of Christ needs to come up and say, I love you, and I minister to you, and I want to share my story with you because my story, it may be different than your story, but we can have a bond. We can have a connection. I know that we go to work on Monday through Friday, and I know Saturdays are tough, and you know what? We come to church on Sunday morning for family, for unity to share our faith, to share our life. When we do that, God gets the glory. We need not to be ashamed of talking to somebody about the biggest message that changed our life, and that is Jesus Christ. We need to share our story. We need to be the witness of who Jesus truly is within our life. We cannot be the undercover Christians. We cannot be like Nicodemus and Josephus they loved Jesus, but they would not proclaim him outwardly. They were leaders in the Sanhedrin, but they didn't follow Jesus till after his death. We need to proclaim his message now. The most powerful testimony you have is what Christ is working in your life to make you into a new person. Well, biggest message, the most powerful thing that you have is not your resources, it's not your abilities, it's when you have failed and you have agreed to God that I failed I have turned my life around and now God is working in my life it's not going to be fixed tomorrow your junk isn't going to be fixed instantaneously it is work to change and it's the biggest testimony you have the most powerful 
testimony you have is when you give something to God and let God fix it. It is the biggest testimony. Our biggest weakness is our pride. When we say, I can do this myself. Mitch, how'd that work out for you? It didn't. I can do this myself. I don't need God. God failed me. I don't need him. Just get away from me. Let me do it myself. And you will see Satan smile and you'll see God cry. Because God wants to wrap his arms around us. We are his children and he wants to take care of us. But sometimes in our pride and sometimes in our anger, we say, I don't want to share my story. I don't want people to know that I'm a failure. But in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, it says this. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they should put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. We need to be able to proclaim the greatest testimony you have is your story and what Jesus Christ has done within your life. When we can proclaim that, we can do great and mighty things. When your friends see your life changing, they may be amazed. They may even be curious and probably a little bit threatened. These kind of steps need to be taken in order to keep your friends from keeping you down and putting others to lift you up. First thing is your lifestyle. Your lifestyle is going to be visible transformation of what God is doing within your life. If we say we have given our life to Christ, but there is not a visible transformation within your life, you may just know about Jesus. You may go to a church. You may say, I'm a Christian. You know, I quit asking people if they're Christians anymore because everybody's a Christian, right? Everybody's a Christian. I got into church when I was five years old. I'm a Christian. You know what I'm asking now? Not are you a Christian. Are you a Christ follower? Are you a Christ follower? <laughs> What's that mean? What did you read today in the Bible? Who did you pray for? What did you look at today? What songs did you sing? What did you give in the offering last week? Did you attend church? Are you a Christ follower? Because being a Christ follower means more than being a Christian because if you belong to a church, you're supposedly a Christian. And there's a lot of people that go to a lot of churches that are not followers of Jesus Christ. We need to be followers of Jesus. And how we know that is our lifestyle. And then the second one is your words. Do your words point to Christ? Do your actions glorify him and do your words point to Christ? Christ is working in you. People will probably assume that you've gotten religion. He's gotten saved. He was transformed. We need to know, not that I have to be, I don't have to say all the right things. I don't have to know all the right things. What I have to be is I have to be genuinely real. I don't need to have the verbiage of Christianity as soon as I get saved. I don't have to know what soteriology, I don't have to know what pneumatology, I don't have to know the verbiage of the church. You know what I have to know? I was a sinner. Jesus saved me. And now I'm going to heaven. I know my marriage was falling apart, but Jesus came and rescued me. I know that I was a failure and I was hurting, but I know that Jesus saved me. And I know I may not be perfect. I know that I may sin. I know that I may mess up. I know that I may cuss. I, 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 I have people come in the office and sometimes it just comes out and they oh, apologize. I said, I've heard it before. I've heard it before. <laughs> sometimes in our words, we need to put, put on Christ. And then your love. Your love should demonstrate Christ's love for people you're witnessing to, people you're talking to. In our witness, if I could be very blunt and honest, where the church, I believe, has failed people outside the church is anger, animosity, and judgment. Sometimes we think that because we have Jesus, we are better than them that has no Jesus. And you know what the difference is? We were once like them. We didn't have Jesus. But we've had Jesus so long, we forget, it's, we forget what it's like to not have Jesus. And we need to love them. We need to encourage them. We need to 
walk into their story and into their life not from a superior position, but from a godly position of humility, love, and care. Our story. They're so diverse. We all have it. Sometimes we're ashamed of them, and sometimes we proclaim it. But every one of our stories is a masterpiece that God is writing in your life. And the masterpiece that God is writing in your story is a masterpiece that we need to share in others. How did Jesus change your life? What did Jesus do within your life that was unique to you? It's your story. And when you tell your story, it is the most beautiful, beautiful thing because God did it for you. In your biggest need, in the biggest failure of your life, Jesus came in and he gave you a story. Now take that story. You know when I said map your world, your friends, your family, your coworkers, the teams that your kids play on? Look for opportunities, divine moments in time where you and your friend or you and a coworker or you or a parent is sitting at the ball field, sitting at a grocery, standing in line at a grocery store, just doing something where that divine moment is opened. When we look for divine moments, they're all over the place. When we close our eyes to those moments, you never see them. But when you say, Lord, give me the opportunity to impact somebody's life, when we pray to God about them, God will open the door for you to share God with them. But sometimes we talk to them before we talk to God, and it's like hitting rocks. But here's what God wants to do. He wants to tender their heart, put an opportunity within your life with somebody that's broken, with somebody that's going through trouble, and they have a need for the story that God has painted in your life, and you come together, and it fixes. God uses you as the tool to change somebody's life. So, our testimony today, our story today, changes somebody else's life. That's what it's all about. So, if you map your world, you know your family, you know your friends, you know what people are going through within your, their life. I want you to write their names down in your heart. I want you to lift up their names towards God. If this church is going to be the church, it needs to be the body of Christ needs to be lifting up people that need Jesus. We need to look for opportunities to share our story to people that need our heart. And then we need to love them. We need to walk within them. We need to bring them to the body of Christ. They need to be able to see what our story has done for us. We need to proclaim the name of Jesus. We need to lift up people's lives. They've been hurt. They've been scarred. But the body of Christ can be the ointment that takes them, heals them, loves them, and gives them a new hope in a new life because of what Jesus Christ has done. Will you please stand to your feet with me? I'm going to ask Justin to make his way up. This invitation could be the witness of the world. It could be about Jesus. If you've never given your life to Christ, I want to be the storyteller of Jesus within your life. I want to tell you that Jesus loves you. I want to tell you that Jesus wants to forgive you. And I want to tell you that Jesus wants to write a new story within your heart. I want to be the witness, the proclaimer of what Jesus Christ has done for my life and what he can do for your life. If you've never given your life to Christ, the story starts today. The story that God wants to plan in your life starts today. But if you are a follower of Christ, and you want to map your world, and there's one or two or three individuals that you know that need your story, that needs the message of Jesus Christ, I would like to offer you an opportunity to bend your knee to your mapped world. And when you bend your knee and you lift their names up to Christ, you look for an opportunity for that encounter, that divine moment of time where God is going to take what you have asked, open the door, ointment of the Holy Spirit of God comes together and gives you the opportunity to lead them to your story 
that gave you Jesus Christ? Have you mapped your world? Do you know their names? Can you see their faces? They are never going to see Jesus until you talk to Jesus about them and use that opportunity, use that divine moment to let God do great and miraculous things within your life.